Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you here this morning in our first week of programming for the year. And we look forward to having a wonderful session here together. In introducing Dr. Stephen Dudikov, it's a great pleasure for me personally because Stephen is not only a friend, he is a member of our centre, and he's also curiosity ridden, never allows information to sit where it is, and has himself gone on a personal research journey into the topic that we're discussing this morning. So I think we're not just having a presentation from a professional, a doctor of repute, but also somebody who, as a human being, is caring, concerned, and I know lives the life that he preaches, which is not always the case. So I think we're very, very fortunate. And in our world where information bombardment is coming from all directions, and I think that the state of play is called confusion, I think it's rather good to have a responsible attitude albeit one that may be a little ahead of the game to share with us, because we're getting so many conflicting pieces of information about health and well-being today. And not only generally, but very specifically in this area of food intake, the kind of food that we have, because today's food is radically different than it was even a generation ago. Today's food has so much extra in it, and I don't mean positively, the extras are full of toxicity as well. And then there's the issue of living in different parts of the world. A lot of us are the product of European immigrant families, different diets in cold climates, different diets in moderate and warm cli climates and the like. And what should we here be actually looking out for? Most specifically in terms of fats, which has received a rather bad rap over the last uh, dozen years plus, and we're going to see that we have to be a little bit more discriminating in the way that we choose to look at the subject matter. Um, in our particular instance, why is it that Spirit Grow is interested in a subject which is seemingly medicinal, physiological? Is because there's a major mitzvah to maintain health and wellness. A mitzvah that is no different than keeping Shabbos keeping kashras, is to be healthy. And therefore, if you don't become critical in the way that we eat as one particular point of health and wellness, we're actually offending the Torah as such. Spiritually speaking, our bodies are, as I said the other night, machinery, biological machinery, physiological machinery. And that machinery has to be kept in good condition. I mentioned that after a person dies, the machinery is still intact, at least most initially, before it decomposes. When you die, your eye is fully intact, but you don't see. Why don't you see? Because the energy system that courses through the machinery to animate it is no longer there. But the machinery is there. So our essence is somewhere beneath the machinery. But in this world of time and space, We've been given this biological machinery in order to express that inner energy, our neshama, our inner personality, who we are. And if we don't keep that machinery in good order, we can't express optimally. So health and wellness is very, very important for personal expression, mind, emotions, communication systems, and the way we impact the world. Therefore, I consider this session to be a very important basic session in terms of one particular arena on how to maintain our biological machinery so that the real you can express itself. So may I ask Dr. Dudikov to share with us and present. He's going to utilize a short presentation <coughs> mode followed by discussion here. We'll open it up so that we're able to learn also from each other. So I thank you again for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to have you here at Spirit Grow. And Stephen, take it away. Thank you. Okay, so 
I do want to leave the floor open for questions. So if any time, if you do have a question, just raise your hand and then we can go through that question. I don't mind the interruptions. If we can't answer it immediately, I'll write it down and we'll get to it eventually. The whole object <clears throat> that I want from this session is for you to leave here having learnt some things, having had the mind stimulated to go and then look up some things for yourself and perhaps question what perhaps you thought you knew before and what may be different for the future. So Label came to me and said, would I give a talk on fat? <clears throat> and, well, that should be a simple three-minute presentation, right? Because there's fat in food, you eat the fat, goes onto the body, and if you're an apple, it goes on your tummy, and if you're a pear, it goes onto your hips. And on the way, it blocks up the arteries and eventually gives you a heart attack and a stroke. Okay. The only problem is, that's not true. Okay? That's a theory, but it actually hasn't been proven. So, because Label, first of all, Label came to me, I thought, okay, I think I'm going to use him for some inspiration. So, I went to the Bible, Leviticus. And all its fat shall be offered, the fat tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the two, the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering to the Lord. Two inferences I want to make from this. When you have to make an offering of a sacrifice, it's actually meant to hurt you. It's either for restitution or to give something that you need to give to Hashem. You're not going to give a skinny little kid or a runt of an animal. It's got to be in good health. It's not allowed to have any blemishes. And the parts you're going to offer up are the good parts. So what did they eat back in those days? They ate from nose to tail. They ate the organs and they ate the fat of the organs and the fat on the animal, as well as the muscle. That's the first inference. And the second inference, of course, Hashem, we're feeding him, we're offering this thing up, we're not going to give him the bad stuff. It's got to be something in the fat. It's quite definitive. That's what they wanted. Okay. Another inference from the Bible. What do you think they're saying there? Okay. Fruit. Is it really as good for you as what you think it is? It depends on your metabolism. I'm not going to say don't eat fruit, but I'm going to say certain people most definitely shouldn't be eating fruit. Fruit contains fruit sugar, fructose. And that is a problem all on its own. And just moving a little bit further in history, good old hypocrisies. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And as I get more experienced in medicine, so more the truer are those words. The drugs we use do come with side effects, do come with complications, do come with risks. And if you can cure something with food, all the better. Even more than that, if you can prevent it with food, even better again. So what we eat is important. Okay, so I'm just going to show at this stage just a little... Okay. Just one second. Just have a look at this. Is that you? No. Definitely not. Now, this is Dr. Um, Andreas Einfeld, a Swedish GP, please work, <laughs> um, who basically has revolutionized the way that the Swedish eat and um, got them to seriously look at their diets. And here we go. Okay. Or Sound? Insulin we will go up and this Just is a what quick happened. look at this. So this is obesity statistics from the US in 1985. White states, we don't have any certain data, but in the blue states, there are around 10% obesity. So, so let's move ahead two years at a time. Have a close look and see if you can spot the difference. 87, 89, 91, 93, and 1995. And there's a new color covering half the nation dark blue, that's over 15% obesity. So it's up 50% in a decade. Let's move on. 
97, 99, 01, 03, 05, 07, 09, 2011, 2014. And it's, yeah, we're in Colorado, we're still yellow, but that's still 20% obesity, it's twice what it was just a few short decades ago. Orange, 25%, red, 30%, and black, 35%. And there's even um, surveys from last year showing that it's even worse now than in 2014, so it's getting worse all the time. Obese Americans have... Here we go. Yep. Okay. So, okay, let's hope this restarts it. Okay. So, US obesity, that's looking at it. On the bottom, we've got time from 1970 through to 2010, and it is still rising. There's been slow progressive increase, basically from the food revolution, with increased harvesting, increased availability of food, slow, steady, progressive increases, increased ability to move food from the farm to take it to places where then we can get access Etc. So there are some underlying reasons of why increased access to food. And then there's been suddenly something happened in 1980 to give a huge acceleration in obesity. And if we look at the um, next slide, this is calories. So calories has been increasing. But look, interestingly, from 2000, it's actually steadied and dropped off a bit of calories available per capita. Yet, we go back to look at from 2000, there's still been an increase in obesity. So it's more than just availability of calories that has made obesity. It's got to be something that we're actually eating that's doing that. So this is trends in obesity. The reason I put this on is because that green one is for youth. We have a problem with childhood obesity now. In fact, diseases as they present have actually changed. Diabetes is an example. There's type 1, which you're just lacking insulin. It's an autoimmune disease. Type 2 diabetes is related to obesity. It was actually called adult onset diabetes when I went through medical school. We are now seeing adult onset diabetes in children. It's now called non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or diabetes type 2. But Yes? What about hypoglycemia? Sorry? Hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia? Right. If you're someone who suffers from hypoglycemia, that's an overreactive state to taking in sugars. That is a warning sign that you could be on your way to becoming diabetic because it's an over-response. So you're taking in carbohydrate, you get a huge outpouring of insulin to much higher levels than a normal person, which then throws the sugar some two to three hours later much lower than even normal so that you're getting low blood sugar and you get the shakes and you get the hungries and you can't concentrate anymore and you just got to have that food. And that's a warning sign you could be developing diabetes. Okay? Right. Um, He's just looking at the world where the problems actually are, and it's mainly around, seems to be around those lower Mediterranean countries and in America. That's for females, pretty similar again for males. It's most of the world suffering. Interestingly, China, Japan, nice good coloration. That's changing. They're starting to eat our food. They are now starting to see diabetes, obesity as well. No different there. And what can obesity do? Well, here are the comorbidities, stroke, cataract, heart disease, diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, pancreatitis, cancer. Yes, obesity causes cancer. Specifically, some cancers are far more sensitive to obesity and sugars than our other ones. Breast cancer, when I went through school, one in 12 women had the risk of breast cancer. It's now one in eight. Something in the environment or what we're reading is affecting that. Okay, veins, arthritis, gout, gynecological conditions like especially polycystic ovarian syndrome, 
gallbladder disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Every time we do scans, CT scans or ultrasounds on the abdomen of people, we're all never saw this back in the 80s, fatty liver disease. Didn't see it, didn't even know it existed as a condition. Now we get reports and almost, well, I'm not going to say everyone, that's exaggerating, but a significant proportion of people have fatty liver disease. And what do we say as doctors for them? Absolutely nothing, because what the hell do we do for it? Well, there is something you can do. We've just got to open our eyes and learn what we need to do. Okay, as well as pulmonary disease. So, diabetes, look at that. 1985, 30 million diabetics in the world. And that's increased 12-fold through to 2011, 1,200% increase. It's projected to get to 552, and that's not equal to the growth in the population. That's exceeding the growth in the population by significant quantities. In fact, a more recent figure, that's 2011. 2015, it's 415 million diabetics in the world now. So, let's get back to what happened in 1980 to suddenly make that go up. So, a bit of history. I'll cover some things, but I'll just say now, what I've done is, I've, there are heaps and heaps and heaps of information available on the internet, and there are some great lectures on YouTube. So what I've done is, I've created a YouTube folder called Stephen Dudikov Fat Talk. And I've put four or five lectures in there, and I'll, I'll show you which ones later on, which ones I've put in there. But they're going to cover interesting topics like, well, cholesterol, is it really bad for you? And um, the history of how we got into this situation, the history of the dietary recommendations, etc. I've also got a second folder. If you find that interesting and you like watching YouTubes and you want to get more into the science and see lectures by some brilliant people, then my folder, Stephen Dudikoff, LCHF, low carb, high fat, LCHF. In there, I've got probably about 60 or so lectures which are worth going through. Self-educate yourself and help manage your own health. Okay, so what happened in 1980 was that the late 70s, America decided, listen, this heart epidemic, it's going too far, it's getting out of hand. Nothing compared to what it is now, but they thought it was out of hand then. They said, we've got to do something. They set up a committee and, and Senator McGovern sat down, listened to the evidence, and then decided that what they should do is eat less fat. Okay, that then was then go through the processes, and eventually in the early 80s, they set up what became known as, for the very first time, the, heart, uh, the dietary recommendations. You know, the RDIs, recommended daily intake, how much of this should we have, how much of that should we have, and they decided fat should be kept under 30% of your calorie intake and saturated fat under 10%. That's sort of where we're at. So an experiment was introduced upon the American people in the early 80s, and we are now living the consequence of it because we now have an epidemic of obesity, and an epidemic of diabetes, and it's now created the new English word, word of diabetes. What they didn't realize is when you say cut down on fat, what happens? There are three type of food groups. There's actually a fourth, and that's alcohol. We'll keep that for a different time. But that's a fluid. It's not really a food that you eat. There is fats, there are protein, and carbohydrates. And carbohydrates is really broken into two kinds. You've got your simple sugars and your complex sugars, your starches. And to the body, all carbohydrates are broken down to sugar internally. So if you're going to cut down on fat, protein essentially has to stay the same. The body can't deal with excess protein, and it's dangerous to it, to the kidneys, etc. Usually people vary between 15 to 17, 17.5% of the calorie intake through protein. Different if you're a bodybuilder, you exercise hard and you take extra protein. That's a special case. But generally speaking, it stays around that 15%, which means, consequently, an increase in carbohydrate. 
Now, at the time they introduced this, the actual evidence <coughs> against fat at the time was poor. You can believe that or not believe it. There are YouTubes and discussions I like to show you about that. But it actually was. It was very poor evidence. What there was no evidence for was, hang on, if you eat a lot of extra carbohydrates, what's going to happen? That wasn't done and it was ignored because that's what happens. If you drop one, you've got to increase the other. And especially considering fat gives a lot of the taste for food. So if you're going to take out the taste, uh-oh, we need to replace it with something. can't just taste like cardboard. So they put in sugar, sugar and more sugar. And that's the consequence. So that's what changed in the 1980s. And unfortunately, or sadly, what it also did, it institutionalised the dietary recommendations. So if you want to go and change it, you know how it is to change an institution. It's difficult. And it politicised the dietary recommendations. This is America. We all know about lobbyists and politicisation. And we have incredible influential lobbyists involved now in this whole industry. We're talking about the agribusiness, billions of dollars. You're talking about big pharma, billions of dollars. And throw into that, there's a little bit of religious fanaticism that's determining why we have the dietary recommendations that we do have at the moment. High fructose corn syrup. Yeah, it's that little bit worse than sugar because what is sugar? Table sugar on your table is a disaccharide. It's two sugars. It's a glucose and a fructose. Fructose is the sweet one. That's why fruit is sweet. Fructose, fruit, sugar. Glucose actually isn't sweet, but it's sticky. And that's also bad for the body because if it's high, it sticks to proteins and it sticks to things and it actually causes a lot of damage. So in America, they went one step further and decided to create high fructose corn syrup. So rather than being like sugar, which is 50-50, it's actually 55% fructose and only 45% glucose. So it's much sweeter. Fructose, believe it or not, is actually even worse for you than glucose. Now, your cells in the body, every cell in your body can use glucose for energy. Not one cell in your body can use fructose for energy. So what does it do with it? So consequently, if you're taking in large amounts of glucose, you certainly don't need to change the fructose into glucose. In fact, there's excess glucose around in your liver stores of glycogen are full and your muscle stores of glycogen are full. So it turns it into the liver into fat. And some of that fat's going to stay there. Thus, the fatty liver disease epidemic we're seeing at the moment. And that fatty liver disease can then inflame the liver and actually cause what is now called NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. There's actually a hepatitis. There's an inflammation of the liver from fat. And that goes on to actual liver disease. It ends up with cirrhosis. And it's now, I think, the most common cause for requirements of liver transplants is from fat. Amazing. Okay, so getting, I'm not going to overdose you on studies. You're going to have to take my word, or else go online and find out for yourself. I've got some which we can point to later if we need to. I want to talk about, though, one study, and that's the Pure study. Because this study, the Pure study, was released last year in Barcelona at the World Cardiac Conference. It's a study that was done by Canadian cardiologists. This study, like the three or four before, it was meant to put the nail in the coffin of fat. And what it did was the exact opposite. So this study, 156,000 people from 18 countries over all the continents, followed for almost eight years in parts, 7.4 in average, it was an extremely high quality prospective cohort study. So a cohort study is where you actually enlist a group of people and you say, OK, tell us what you eat and then we're going to see what diseases they actually end up having. And they got everyone on this study to fill in questionnaires along the way. And they went a step further. They actually got 
a subset of people to actually make a food diary for a period of time. I think it was two weeks or so. And then they compared people's responses to what they wrote on their questionnaire as to how they physically did things on their food diary. Because the questionnaire, you may forget things or remember things. And they made a comparison, so they were able to make inferences according to how accurate people were in their questionnaire compared to their literal, what they were reading, food diary. And the idea of this particular study was to see the association of fats and carbohydrate intake with cardiovascular disease and mortality. And don't ever forget that last one. And that's where a lot of the drugs go awry. Now, what they did is they divided the people by their answer into five different groups, into quintiles. So just looking at, say, fat in total, all right, which group ate the least amount of fat, and then the next least amount, the middle amount, the next higher amount, and then the highest amount of fat. So the lowest quintile, the highest quintile. They looked at saturated fat, they looked at protein, they looked at carbohydrate intake by that way. So they divided into quintiles. What did they find? Saturated fat intake, the lowest quintile. And these guys must have been very, very health conscious because they kept their energy intake of saturated fat, which was dietary recommended to be under 10%, they kept it at 2.8% of energy. They were the group most likely to die. They were the group most likely to have a stroke. And they were the ones that had the most cardiovascular disease, not statistically significant. Draw what conclusion you want from that. So you can't really say it increases heart disease. But they did have higher amounts. Okay, the important thing with this is interesting. It's the reverse that's not actually said. Because groups two, three, four, and five were all equal. All they did is when you got to the last group, boom, increased stroke, increased death rate. But as you then increase the, the fat, what's really interesting, what they we're expecting, and what everyone thought would happen, as you increase the fat, you're going to increase heart attack and all-cause mortality and stroke, didn't happen. Flat. No increase. That is significant. Okay. Group two to five, no differences. Then they looked at the total fat intake. The lowest quintile group again, most likely to die group most likely to have a stroke. Then they looked at carbohydrates. What did they find? Increase in carbohydrates is associated with increased death and in a linear way. So the lowest quintile, the lowest group of carb eaters, they got their level of death, whatever it would be. And as you increase the carbohydrates, you increase the death rate in a linear way. An increase in cardiovascular death in a linear fashion. They then looked at protein, and they found that with animal protein, there's an actual reduced mortality. Okay, so that's where we're going to leave this for the moment. I'll just reduce this. Let me put this up. We may go back to this in a minute. So if you don't mind answering some personal questions, but who here wants to lose fat? Want to lose some weight? Okay. Who here has type 2 diabetes? Okay, not many. Pity, I wish we had some more. <laughs> you are not representative of the population. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, the reason why. So with the diabetics, what happens is when you're first diagnosed with diabetes, you go to a doctor. Doc, 
I'm thirsty, I'm drinking a lot, I'm going to the toilet and I'm weeing a lot, and I've been losing weight and I'm lethargic, I've got no energy. What's wrong? Ah, doctor's clever. Oh, this person's probably got diabetes. Give me some urine, test the urine. Yep, there's sugar in there. You do the appropriate blood test. What happens next? In all probability, you're going to be sent to a diabetes educator, you're going to be sent to a dietitian, and you're probably going to get sent to an endocrinologist. Meanwhile, he starts you on some medicine. And even going through all of that process, so did you guys go through such a process? Yeah? I can say something. Yeah. yeah. Seven years ago, I had a Rosh Hashanah here in the show at Emile Hub, labor story. Sorry, say that again, you had a what? Emile Hub. Oh, you had the heart attack first and then found out you were diabetic, yeah. I don't know that I think it's already like nine years. Oh, okay, yep. Okay, so the important, important lesson there is that's the association between diabetes and heart disease. All right, there's a very, very clever American cardiologist from New York, just not that long ago, passed away in his 90s, Dr. Kraft, who basically said, Every person with a heart attack is either diabetic or just hasn't been diagnosed yet. In fact, they're not a different disease. In almost, I'm not going to say in all, but in almost all heart attacks, diabetes is the underlying cause. And this is why I'm going to get to the question of what were you told when you were first diagnosed as diabetes? What was your problem? So we don't have many to answer. I'm going to have to answer for everyone. What you're probably going to be told is you've got a problem, you've got too much sugar. Okay? So what do all the treatments Focus on the lowering of your sugar. Now, that's a good idea from one perspective because we do know by doing this, we reduce the incidence of the small blood vessel diseases. So we reduce the incidence of the eye disease, okay, retinopathy, the kidney, the nephropathies, and the nerve disease, the neuropathies. What the treatment didn't do until just very new drugs, which I only just started, and we'll get into them in a second, it didn't reduce the large blood vessel diseases. It didn't change it. So any of the treatments we've been using for the last 50, 60 years to treat diabetes made zero impact on heart attacks, strokes, and amputations. Okay, why? So you were told you've got a sugar problem, and they focused on the sugar. What I'm going to tell you is, that high sugar is a symptom. So if you come to me and you say, I've got a sore throat, and I have a look and I say, yeah, there's tonsillitis, and you've got the fever, so here, go home, take Panadol, and I don't treat that strep throat, you're going to end up with Quincy in a couple of days and be in the hospital needing a surgical operation to lance the abscess. Same with the urine infection. You come in, oh, look, I'm weeing all the time, and it's burning, and um, gee, it's really um, quite, quite uncomfortable. So, um, oh yeah, this person's got a urine infection. Here, take some urine, it's going to stop the burning, goodbye. No, the underlying problem was an infection in the kidney. They're going to need antibiotic to kill the bacteria in the bladder, not just take urine to stop the burning. When a person comes to me, firstly diagnosed with diabetes, high blood sugar is the symptom, the underlying cause, and what almost, well, Every, I'll say in a second. What the underlying cause is, is high insulin levels that the body's not listening to. Insulin resistance. Now, I have done a little test over the last year. Over the last year, I've spoken to every person who's a diabetic and I ask them, what is diabetes? And they all tell me it's a problem with sugar. And I say, okay. And with respect to insulin? Oh, yeah, I haven't got enough of that. And that's why I have to take insulin or why I've got tablets to release more insulin. Not one who's been to a diabetic educator, to a dietitian, to an endocrinologist, and is seeing a GP knew that they actually had high insulin that the body wasn't listening to, not low insulin. That's a type 1. Type 1 diabetic, antibodies, attack the pancreas, stop it making insulin, you're deficient. That's a problem. If you've got high insulin why on earth are you then going to go on a drug that makes your body release more? Makes no sense. But that's what happens. Yep? How does too much sugar affect kidneys? I'm not quite sure why you're, or how you're asking that. Just take it as truth at will. It, it, it affects small blood vessels, okay? 
And by affecting the small blood vessels, where there are small blood vessels, you get the small blood vessel consequences of the high sugar, and they'll block and therefore cause damage to that organ. And that's why you specifically get retinopathies, nephropathy, and neuropathy. Okay? So you do want to get the sugar down. I'm not saying you don't want to do that, but like I said, that's a symptom. So let's go back to the cause. So if the sugar is high for a reason, the reason is, is because you've got high insulin, and to treat it by making even more insulin makes no sense because your body has insulin resistance. Now, that as a disease did not occur overnight. That is a 35, 40 year story in progress. What makes your body release insulin? Well, very simplistically, let's just say it like this. If you eat a carbohydrate, it's going to make you release insulin at a level of 100. If you eat a protein, it makes you release insulin of 25. And if you eat a fat, it makes you release insulin at a level of 2. Okay, so if we are eating, as we're told to eat, multiple small meals all the day, let's graze, and let's have our grains and cereals in the morning, and we're going to have fruit during the day, and then we're going to have sandwiches during lunchtime, and again, we're going to have sugar and, and milk in our coffee, and then we're going to have a meal and there'll be potatoes or it might be a pasta meal and we're going to have some dessert at the end and maybe during the evening a chocolate or two or some bickies with our tea or something. Carbohydrate, 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 carbohydrate. Insulin release, insulin release, insulin release, insulin release, insulin release. We are releasing large amounts of insulin for long periods of time all through the day. What happens? Accommodation. The body has a thing called accommodation. When there's something there in a large amounts for a long period of time, it learns to ignore it. You've got an awful ear sound, if you've got tinnitus or something like that, well, it would drive you batty if it was there all the time and you, you heard it the same way you did when it first started. The body learns to accommodate, it turns off, it switches off and it learns to ignore it. Same happens if I gave you a sleeping tablet tonight, it would knock you out. Take one every night for the next three weeks. I would need two to get the same effect as the first time I gave it to you. The body gets used to it. So if you've got large amounts of insulin for large periods of time, the body learns to ignore it. Example, insulinoma. That is an insulin-forming cancer. A cancer of the pancreas releases excess insulin. We have certain levels, but a person with insulinoma has levels that are so, so high that they would kill any normal person many, 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 many months beforehand, but the body got used to the higher levels so it was able to cope. It didn't throw the sugar down too low as a consequence. So what caused the high insulin? Too much carbohydrate. What happens when a person is newly diagnosed and they're sent to a dietitian? You're told to eat 55 to 60% of your diet as carbohydrate. Go figure, something's not right. Doesn't make sense. That's why it's so important I talked about the Pure Study, because there's three foods. If you're obsessed, you can't have fat, you can only have carbohydrate. You're stuck as a diabetic. But that's not the case. Because if you can, in fact, have fat, you can have your protein, kill the carbs, eat the fat, reverse your diabetes. And yes, it happens, and I do it, and there is now a study that actually confirms it, just got released last week, called the Verta study. And these people put people on a ketogenic diet. They originally released their results after 10 weeks, showing that they could reverse diabetes within 10 weeks. And everyone said, oh, that's fantastic, but that's only 10 weeks. People can't stay on that diet long term. It's now been a year, and they're still on the diet, and the results they've been getting are absolutely astronomical. The, the study is called this diet. The, well, the diet is just low carb, throwing you into ketosis. So low carb, let's talk about that. Let's define what it is. Normally, people eat 300, 400 grams of carbs a day. A low carb diet is defined as under 120 grams a day. But if you want to go into ketosis, you need to go down to 50 or 40 grams, under 50 or 40 grams a day, roughly. And if you really got diabetes and you want to reverse diabetes, you need to get under 20 grams a day. And that's total carbs. So it's much better if the carbs are in a form that they're with lots of fiber. And that's why you can eat basically as much as you want as the 
stuff growing out of the ground. What you need to avoid is the stuff that was able to hide away from the animals and protect itself and build up its carb load. That's why the tubers growing under the ground are no-nos. That's why your potatoes and your sweet potatoes and be careful of carrots and onions, great for a salad, a little bit, not a problem. But you don't then sit there as one person said, oh yeah, I love my onions, I have pickled onions, I eat seven a day. Well, mm, no, too many carbohydrates. Okay. Yep. I realize that uh, most of the foods are only for the stock loads of carbs, and I really don't know how to deal with that because I really read the ingredients. I'm sorry, you? There are lots of carbs to most of the food. Yeah, it's already. hidden in it, you betcha. It's hidden. They've got to go find it and keep it down. So if I want to eliminate lots of carbs, what shall I eat at the end? Look, the simplest, I'll get, what I give people, the very simplest thing, go on the internet and type in Banting Red, Red, Yellow, Blue. Then there's a chart, the Banting chart. So this is big in South Africa, they know the Banting diet. Banting is a guy, not the, not the Banting who discovered insulin, as actually turns out, but this guy Banting in the 1800s was an Englishman, I think he was an undertaker, and he was a bit corpulent. And he tried all the diets and none of them worked. So let's talk about diets. So he tried all the diets and none of them worked. And eventually he heard about a physician, I think it was in France, and he went over there and he discovered if he stopped the carbohydrates, he lost weight. And he wrote it up and it became an incredible selling news leaf or whatever, the, the way they did it back then. Okay, so he released a, sh a sheet of paper or a news leaf or a little book or whatever it was, um, talking about his experience, I think it was a letter on corpulence or whatever, and said, kill the carbs, you'll lose weight. Okay, now, that's a truism. It's true. Why? Simple. Our mate insulin again. I ask every diabetic, I actually ask every person that comes into me that I have this discussion with, what does insulin do? And I ask this to doctors, and everyone says it drops down the blood sugar level. That's fine, but that's actually its number two role. Because you know what its number one role is? To stop fat being broken down. Okay? It stops fat being broken down. And it's the famine hormone, because when you eat a lot of food, a car without petrol for one second stops. We don't. You cannot eat for two months before you might stop because we've got reserves of energy. So when there's food and we've got plenty, the body says, ah, lots of food, let's grab it and store it away. So it releases the insulin, the insulin takes the food and it stores it away. It takes all the glucose and the sugars and converts it to glucose and forms it as glucose, glycogen in the liver, glycogen in the muscles and all the extra amounts. It then turns into fat and sends it across to the body and stores it away as fat. Now the body's not stupid and it's not going to waste energy on a vicious cycle. So if you're making fat, you don't want to be breaking it down, making, breaking down, making, breaking down, making... Waste of energy and stupid. So while it's making fat, what does it do? Blocks you from breaking it down. So if you're on a diet still containing carbs, releasing lots of insulin, you're fighting against your own body. But if you go on a diet where you drop your insulin levels, you can break the fat down easier now. Simple. Okay. Yes, no, well, it depends on how aggressive you want to be as to how, low, how much you lower and how, how good you are at keeping at it. But essentially, for most people, it works. Now, this is not for everyone. It's for a majority of people. It is most definitely for you if you are metabolic. And I'm defining metabolic as anyone who has a propensity to becoming eventually diabetic. Because, again, medicine... Its biggest problem is we are focusing so much on the tree and we forgot there's a forest. We see, like if you go back to that original thing where we had the little fat man and we had all the diseases of that fat man, and we see different risk factors. Yeah, obesity is a risk factor, diabetes is a risk factor, and high cholesterol is a risk factor, and this is a... It's all correlated. It's all part of the same system. Okay? So... Is there an Well, yes, you might. Oh, let me, in, in rough terms, absolutely. You could even have heard of the Banting diet, low-carb, high-fat diet, a keto diet, 
the paleo diet, and even the 5-2 diet. Now, these things work for a lot of people, even the 5-2. And the question is why? Because they're anti-insulin. But the 5-2 diet is that you eat Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And it still works because it's anti-insulin. For two days, you're restricted to, what, 600 calories a day? So for two days, you're in an extreme state of not having food, essentially fasting and not releasing insulin for two whole days. The body's regaining insulin sensitivities and you're keeping your levels really low, which then allows you to eat what you want for the next five days and you're still going to lose weight. That's how important dropping insulin is. But that, that's basically fasting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And intermittent fasting, you raised a very interesting point because intermittent fasting is a great way to lose weight and regain your health and increase longevity as well. So, so we've got... Sorry? Oh, sure. Only if you don't want to reverse your type 2 diabetes. It's because if you're on tablets that are going to force your blood sugar low because you're taking tablets that are going to a pancreas and say, release insulin, release insulin, release insulin, irrespective of even what your sugar levels are. That doesn't make sense. Why would anyone be on such a drug? But yet they're using it. The sulfonylureas do that. The newer ones, okay, the gliptins, they're a bit better. They also release... Um, insulin from the pancreas, but they only do it on demand depending on what food you've eaten. But again, it's an illogical way to approach the disease when your problem is you've already got excess insulin in the body, why take a drug that makes you release more? Doesn't make sense to me. So, so question, sorry, was it about fat and the liquid cholesterol, saturated fats and... Exactly. So that's the big worry and that's what scares the endocrinologists. So... That's what this is about. What we don't want to do is have an event, a heart attack or a stroke or an amputation, right? Now, there is a theory called the lipid hypothesis. The lipid hypothesis is that cholesterol is going to block up your arteries. No, it doesn't. Myth number one. Okay? Cholesterol does not block your arteries. Okay. Inflammation does. And the, even the cardiologists will now say, and I saw a talk here, the first thing he said was, yep, inflammation is going to block the arteries, now let's talk about cholesterol. And that was the end of that. And that's all he said. And it was all about the drugs we can use and how we can lower cholesterol. It depends on what kind of cholesterol you've got in the body. Okay? So if you've had a cholesterol test, you're going to know. There's your total cholesterol. Essentially, you can ignore that figure. Then you've got your HDL your so-called good cholesterol, which it mostly is. You've got your LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, which it may be or may not be. Okay? And you've got your triglycerides. I don't know if I mentioned that already, but triglycerides. And that's the key, because the triglycerides are the fats in the blood. And it's the triglycerides that are actually going to determine whether the LDL is good or bad. You see, when you measure the blood, when you measure cholesterol, you are doing a measurement. When you measure the HDL, you're measuring the HDL. And when you measure triglycerides, you measure the triglycerides. The LDL isn't a measurement. It's arithmetic. It's not a measurement. It's arithmetic. And that arithmetic depends on the other figures. And if your triglycerides too high, I think the level is four. If it's above four, they don't even tell you what your LDL is because the arithmetic that gives you the LDL is now a nonsense. It doesn't make sense. LDL, though, can be measured. And guess what happens when you measure it? There are actually seven kinds of LDL. It's not one entity. There are seven kinds. So in essence, simplifying it a little bit, but... You've got two kinds which we'll call the big fluffy LDLs and they are good. They are not a problem. And you've got the five other small dense LDLs and they become a problem. And the smaller and denser, the more the problem. And they hang around and they get oxidised and they get glycated and then they'll go to an area where there's inflammation and boom, block up your artery. So... What causes the small, dense LDLs? Your triglyceride level needs to be under 1.2. So the big, the most, there are two significant ratios. One that gets reported on the test, and that's your total cholesterol divided by your HDL. 
that's important and it should be under four, four and a half. Can creep a little bit above it, but that's where you'd like to keep it. That is, at the moment, from that blood test, the best predictor of whether you're going to develop heart disease. What gives that ratio its power is the HDL, and what determines HDL amounts, again, how much carbohydrates you're eating and your triglyceride level. Because the triglycerides are the fats in the blood. When your liver makes fats, it then packages it in boats, and the boats carry its package around to the body, and it roughly lasts about two weeks in the blood and goes back to the liver, and you don't have a problem. It's a healthy, a good, a happy situation to be in. So little boats are the lipoproteins. So you get your VLDLs, which become the IDLs, which become the LDLs, and it goes around in the blood and eventually goes back to the liver. What becomes a problem, though, is if these are full of triglycerides, and all fat, rather than just cholesterol, then the HDL comes along and says, oh, I'll help you out. So I'll take some of your triglyceride, and it gives it some cholesterol back. And that process occurring and occurring and occurring and occurring eventually gives you something full of, becomes a small dense LDL full of this cholesterol. So it's important to know whether the LDLs are really the good kind or the bad kind, and essentially you can predict that via the triglyceride level, because if that's a nice low level, if that's 0 0.6, 0 0.7, you don't really have a problem. But you can physically measure it. That's not covered by Medicare. It's laboratory done up in Sydney, and you can do what's called the LDL subfractions if you want to. But I guess, yeah, we've got a question. Um, my naturopath says, based on my blood work, he says it's not so cut and dry, and I'm sure you agree there's exceptions to everything and different people. So he said, I had a husband and wife each having the same diet and didn't respond exactly the same way. One of them had a problem with their blood work, one of them didn't. And he was saying, in my case, me particularly, is I need to keep my saturated fat, not low, but lower maybe than I was having. Because he said, in my case, he felt that the saturated fat was contributing to a bit of an issue with cholesterol not being that good. Now, I don't remember all the details. But if it was Would literally... possible? The answer is most definitely yes, 100%. But if that, is that true for you? Because he's just worried about your cholesterol. So if your total cholesterol is high, I've got a patient where it's basically over 12. But we've then done another test. This is called a CT cardiac calcium score. We've actually looked at the arteries in his heart and his score was zero. When a score of zero comes back on a calcium score, that's almost a guarantee that you're not going to have an event in 10 to 15 years. So the question is, what actual damage is this high cholesterol doing? In other words, is there really a disease hypercholesterolemia? No, there is not. And is it a risk factor? It depends, because how high is the LDL and what kind of LDLs are there? Is there inflammation in the body? So the whole point of what I physically do now, so the story on me is it's low carb, high fat. I've done it for over a year. Previous to that, I was, over a, I was about 100 kilograms. So my wife was at me, lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. <laughs> We did the Golden Door, yeah. Gwingana, yeah. Gaia, yeah. did all of that. Yeah. 50th birthday, booked me in with a gym. Okay, So with sensible exercise and diet, I'll get to that in a second, I was able to get down to from 100 to basically 93. 92, 93, I stuck around. But no matter what I did, I couldn't get love in 93. Now that in itself, I'm going to tell you, is remarkable. Because 90% of people on a low calorie diet, put it on again and end up heavier than when they started. Only 10% keep it off. I was one of the 10%. I was lucky. But I wasn't in a rush and I knew I took my time. I wasn't going to rush. <laughs> okay. But I couldn't get any further than that 93. And then I fortuitously met someone who'd lost 20 kilograms. He did this thing called low carb, high fat. And so he said some other things that really piqued my interest because he was saying some things I knew to be true about inflammation and stuff like this. And so I got on the net and I was blown away by the things I learned and saw. And it's 
confronting when you've been practicing one way for 39 years and suddenly you realize you've been mistreating diabetes and all the people I was telling to just count your calories and exercise more. The problem with that model is this. Calories, forget them. Calories. You eat too much. You are gluttons. Stop eating so much. Whose fault is it? It's yours. Take in less energy. Put out more energy. God, you're lazy. Get up off your ass and start doing some exercise. So that is what a low-calorie, high-exercise model is saying. It's your fault and it's your fault. You eat too much, you don't exercise enough. Meanwhile, like what I'm trying to tell you is, you're eating the wrong foods, you're making too much insulin, there's a hell of a lot more going on. Work with your body, don't fight against it. A lot more happens as well. The incredible thing about this diet, so I did the diet and I basically went from 93 down to now 81. So, gone down, 38 pants, 33, 34, depending on the cut. Much nicer way to be. Yep, we've got some questions. Um, what, what's the best thing to eat for, I was eating high fat for bone density, as well as like, you know, calcium. Yep. But then the cholesterol went crazy. Yep. And I got scared. Yep. And now I'm back to low fat. Now yep. I'm worried about my bone density. Yep. What I'm going to do. Exactly. And so I'd say go on the internet and go onto my, the, the page I've set up and watch the lectures and learn to not be scared of fat. How I learned, how I got to lower my weight was by starting to eat fat. Cheese is not so bad for you and the dairy and it's not. You can, and it depends on your own taste and how you want to go about doing it. Whether you do a paleo, which basically has no dairy, but they eat some fruit, or whether you go low carb, high fat, where you're going to eat the cheese, but you don't have any fruit. Okay, but what I'm trying to explain to you is that cholesterol doesn't cause events. Now, what I've put in the folder is a lecture by Dr. Daniel Aronov. He's a Melbourne GP. Last year, he went to the GP conference in Sydney and he did a presentation up there. And at the start of it, to his audience of GPs, he said, who believes in the Lipid hypothesis, that is, if cholesterol goes up, you get more heart disease, and if cholesterol goes down, you get less heart disease. And of course, 90 over 90% 90 of people put up his hand. By the time he finished the presentation, the response was 10%. And what he did was he looked at every drug trial, every drug trial that was ever done to affect the parameters of cholesterol and HDL and LDL and all of these parameters, and saw, did it actually change events? So if you take a drug and it drops your LDL, it's got to be good, right? I'll give you the perfect drug. There's a drug that lowers your cholesterol, raises your HDL, drops your LDL, drops your triglycerides. You can't get a better profile response from medicine. Zero impact on cardiac events or mortality. And it's a simple one too, because it's a vitamin. Nicotinic acid does all of those things, but it doesn't change your outcomes. No change in death. Okay? Well, why? Because they're just parameters. They're not outcome. You're playing with little parameters, but does that change the underlying thing that caused to make those parameters significant? You're just playing with levers rather than going to the underlying cause. Why are they? Yes, it's good if you eat lower carbs so that your HDL is going to go up and your triglycerides goes down and you get a shift in your LDL to the better LDLs, okay? But to artificially try and... So they did one drug, the CETP inhibitor drugs. They tried to do a drug which blocked, like I said, the HDL will go to this LDL full of triglyceride and it's going to say, I'll help you. I'm going to... I'm just trying to ignore that. Okay, I'm going to give you some of my cholesterol and take all that triglyceride that you're carrying to help you. That's the CTP enzyme. So what do they think? They think, oh, let's block that so that we won't cause that from happening, So, which is a nonsense thing in principle if you understand what's physically going on. Why on earth would you want to do that? But it had a dramatic response in reducing the LDL. The only problem was it killed people, so they had to stop that study because you wouldn't want to do that. Why would you if you understood the principle of how it works? I know that there are a good number of questions and I know that uh, Dr. Stephen just is getting warmed up <laughs> and we're just starting to get 
a real radical reappraisal of what we all believed and thought and therefore we've just been provoked for more. And I suppose we could go on for another hour or two quite comfortably. I don't know if Dr. Dukov is running away or not. I suspect not. No. And therefore I'm sure that there are people who may want to approach him and have a chat. But I do know there are people who have agendas where they have to get away. So this has begun, become the beginning of the conversation. And I really do hope that uh, um, Dr. Stephen has in fact provided you with that kind of impetus to look further and he's provided you with some references in terms of his uh, the sites which you should be visiting um, and please feel free to approach him after I thank him here so that you can have your own questions responded to. Um, a very small token of thank you. Uh, it was very, very generous for you to take your time and spend it with us. I think we're not... Oh, it was a I suspect it's not going to be your last appearance here, um, judging by the way that the audience was glued to the information that you shared with us. For those of you who are moving out of the room, we've got another, a new little gadget. It's called a little pass donation machine. You'll see it as you walk out. If you wave your credit card at it, it'll take $2 out and it'll put it into the account and help make these sessions take place. Feel free, no compulsion. Thank you very, very much for joining us and have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Sure. Yeah, metformin's one of the good drugs. Because it's sensitized.